What's up, cool worlds? Today we're going to talk about a special kind of planet called an eyeball Earth, like this object back here. But to get to that, we first have to talk about tides. Okay, so we're all probably familiar with the basic idea of tides, especially if you live near a shoreline, and you will see the tide come in and out twice a day, wreaking havoc to our carefully constructed sandcastles. So basic question, why does this happen? Tide goes in, tide goes out. Never miscommunication. You can't explain that. Yes, I can, Bill. Actually, tides are a very well understood physical process, and on the Earth, they are largely due to the Moon. The Moon's gravity tugs on the Earth, but because the gravitational force is stronger when one is closer to a massive body, then the near side of the Earth is going to feel a stronger gravitational tug than the far side. And this causes the oceans and even actually rock on the near side of the Earth to bulge out a little, and the bulk of the Earth to pull away from the far side a little which leaves another bulge over on that side as well. Now these bulges are the points of high tide, and so as the Earth spins round, each point on the surface will encounter two high tides per day. Tides have become so sexy these days, they're even making cameos in films, such as the movie Interstellar. Those aren't mountains. They're waves. A slightly more subtle tidal effect called tidal friction can actually cause the Earth's spin to slow down over time. And no, I'm not talking about Christopher Reeve's Superman here. Because the Earth's spin period is a little bit quicker than the Moon's orbital period, the Earth's love handles essentially overtake the Moon and end up pointing slightly off axis away from the direction of the Moon. Now remember the Moon is like a gravitational magnet, so it is going to actually pull that leading bulge back towards itself, applying what we'd call a torque to the Earth. And this torque, which has been active over the entirety of the Earth's history, has been slowly removing angular momentum off the Earth, which means that if you went back in time to when the Earth first formed, the day, the rotation period, would actually be about two or three hours, not the 24 hours that we have right now. So with the two or three hour day, I mean, if you lived in LA, you would spend your entire life living in your car, commuting back and forth to work. And this tidal friction is still happening to the Earth, which means every century, our day actually increases by about two milliseconds. And this situation is just gonna keep going, the Earth keeps slowing down until eventually, in tens of billions of years time, its spin rate will be equal to the revolution rate of the Moon around the Earth. And that's a state that we call tidal locking. Now because the Moon is just 1% the mass of the Earth, the tidal friction it felt as a result of the Earth is much, much stronger. And thus just 10 million years after the Moon formed, it was already tidally locked to us, the Earth. And that's why when you look up at the Moon, you always see the same side, the near side of the Moon. We actually didn't get our first image of the far side of the Moon until a Soviet probe called Luna 3 flew around the Moon in 1959. As the Earth continues to gradually spin down, the law of conservation of angular momentum requires that the Moon must actually move outward from us at about four centimeters per year an effect known as tidal acceleration. You can kind of think of this like the spinning ice skater. One way for her to slow down is for her to stick out her leg, thereby increasing her moment of inertia. So in the same way, you can kind of think that the Earth is trying to slow down its spin, and one way for it to do that is for it to stick out its leg, which in this case is the Moon. So this means that billions of years ago, the Moon must have been much closer to us. In fact, when it first formed, it would have been about 25 times larger in our sky, which would have been an awesome sight for any of you time travelers out there thinking of trying to get a good vacation photo. Now, it turns out that these tidal effects are not just important for the Earth-Moon system, but they also play an important role for many of the exoplanets we are discovering around other stars. In particular, tidal locking can play an important role when assessing the habitability of planets like those around Proxima Centauri and Trappist-1. Those stars, like, by the way, three quarters of all stars in the universe, are M dwarfs which means they have a fraction of the mass of that of the Sun. These low mass stars give off less heat, and so the warm habitable zone around them has to move in much closer. Just like how if you make the campfire a lot weaker, you need to get closer to it to keep your hands warm. And remember, since tidal effects are really just a consequence of gravity, and gravity works best when things are close together, then these closer in habitable zones are gonna experience much stronger tidal forces leading to very rapid tidal locking. So this means that one side of your planet is always facing your star, 
an endless day, where the sun appears at the same position in the sky permanently. And it is these types of planets which have picked up the nickname eyeball Earths. On the day side of such a planet, one might expect it to be baking hot endlessly, potentially leading to a vast, inhospitable desert. On the night side, the temperatures could drop so cold that the oceans and even the atmosphere could freeze solid, which would lead to gas from the day side to rush round, it would freeze as well, and eventually we'd have total atmospheric collapse. Okay, so yeah, these things are not good for life. And remember that since M dwarfs are 75% of all stars in the universe, we are talking about the bulk of the universe's habitable real estate. So this is not purely just an academic question. Fortunately, there are some solutions which might allow life to still survive. First, oceans and thick atmosphere could redistribute the heat, so much so that they could actually stop the night side from getting freezing cold and causing this atmospheric collapse situation. Second, in the so-called terminator region, which divides the two hemispheres, one might imagine the temperatures there to be a little bit more temperate, and therefore potentially life could be clinging on on this thin annulus. Third, recent work has shown that evaporation from the day side of the planet can actually form almost like a cloud sombrero on the day side, keeping it nice and cool. And finally, although the planets indeed have a permanent day and night side, any moons around those planets, regardless of their tidal locking situation, would still receive equal amounts of illumination on both sides of those moons. So sorry, Pink Floyd, there is no such thing as the dark side of a moon, but there is such a thing as the dark side of a planet. So given the right conditions, planets like Proxima b could indeed still be habitable, although surely their climates are gonna be very alien to that of our own. One thing I didn't have time to talk about today was tidal heating. If you wanna hear about that, let me know down in the comments below and I can do another video on that another time. So thank you so much for watching this video, everybody. I hope you enjoyed learning about alien tides. And if you have any other questions about them, do be sure to ask them in the comments below and I will get back to you. So until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious. In particular, have... Uh...